This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is an iconic actor, director, and producer who rose to global superstardom through his multi-award winning portrayal of Bobby Ewing on the legendary TV show Dallas, and also in the TV movies Dallas J.R. Returns and Dallas War of the Ewings, as well as the 2004 television special Dallas Reunion Return to South Fork. He then returned to the reboot of the show in 2012 for three seasons. Our guest also created the roles of Mark Harris in Man from Atlantis, Frank Lambert on Step by Step, and Stephen Logan on The Bold and the Beautiful. His movie credits include Hurricane, The Last of Mrs. Lincoln, Cry for the Strangers, Children of the Bride, Heart of Fire, Healing Hands, You Again, The Christmas Promise, and many more. And he's guest starred on dozens of popular TV shows, including Charlie's Angels, Knott's Landing, New Heart, Touched by an Angel, The Fosters, and NCIS, just to name a few. He's also appeared on stage in the UK in 12 Angry Men, and with his equally talented, beautiful partner, Linda Pearl, for six months in the play Catch Me If You Can. In addition, our guest is a producer, and he also directed many episodes of Dallas, Step by Step, and other TV shows. I am delighted and honored to welcome Patrick Duffy to our show. Mr. Duffy, thank you so much for being here. God, I feel so old now, Harvey, <laughs> to listen to all of that. What a, I've had a very fortunate career. Thank you for listing those. I appreciate it. You certainly have, and we will be touching on many of the special moments in your career, at least the highlights for me. Now, you graduated from the University of Washington with a degree in drama, but you initially registered at the school to be an architect. How yeah. did you end up studying drama? Well, you know, my father was a carpenter, a bartender and a carpenter, and, and I felt I, I apprenticed with him and I learned the craft and I thought, well, the next step up from working with your hands and wood would be to design things. So I thought I would try and be an architect. But at the same time, I was doing, you know, as so many people do, high school drama programs, you know, after school plays, et cetera, et cetera. And in my senior year, uh, my drama teacher, who is now past, but I'll never forget or lack appreciation for her, Maxine Dysart, sat me down just before graduation and said, you know, there are people who make a living doing what you're enjoying doing after school. And if you'd like, I'll write a letter to a special program I know at the University of Washington and let's see if you can get in. I said, okay. And I went home and told my dad, literally he was reading the paper and I said, hey dad, I'm gonna be an actor, not an architect. And he looked up and said, oh, okay. And he went back to reading his paper. So I auditioned for the program. Uh, over 2,000 people auditioned throughout the United States, and they picked 12 of us, and we worked together for four years. We were in rehearsal, class, and production for four years, and that just started it. Then I was out of work for about four years after that, but at least I was well-trained. Were you surprised that your dad took it so easily, that you wanted to pursue acting? Well, I really wasn't, I, uh, and it wasn't that like I expected any response you know, we were Montana people, and and my sister, who's three years older than I, was was in the school of oceanography at the University of Washington to be an oceanographer. She was had her master's, going to go for a PhD. She took a class in martial arts to stay in shape. Met some policemen, went home and said, "I'm not going to be an oceanographer. I'm going to be a policeman." And they said, "Oh, okay." It wasn't that they didn't care. I think there are just this Montana upbringing is you do whatever you want to do. Nobody should tell you what you can or can't do. And best of luck to you. And my parents really epitomize that. And um, I'm forever grateful for that because I, you hear so many stories and I'm a parent. My son, you know, is a writer, a playwright, and he had a good paying job at a theater, but not playwriting. And it was a legitimate job with health benefits and everything. And I was doing a play in London and he called me and said, Dad, I think I'm going to quit. And I did the dad thing. I said, oh, well, son, you know, you have health benefits and a steady income, maybe. And he said the magic phrase. He said, Dad, my soul is dying. And I went, OK, quit. You got to quit no matter what. We'll take care of you until. And now he's a he's a playwright and a producer of plays and has a theater in Los Angeles. So it seems to be a consistent sort of, I don't know, homesteader kind of attitude about life. And um 
my parents exemplified that to both my sister and myself. Well, you benefited from it, and so did your son. Now, after graduating from university, your first big break was starring in the role of Mark Harris in The Man from Atlantis. I loved that show. When you were a young actor, who were the actors you looked up to as role models? Jimmy Stewart. Oh. It was. I mean, every film to this day, he is the actual uh, epitome to me of everything that I think an actor should be. You know, he's reluctantly a hero most of the time. He is he is not a, a break down the door kind of guy. He is compassionate, but he has a sense of right and honor and all those things that you just see him exemplify on screen all the time. And coincidentally, then in television during the 60s and 70s, it was Michael Landon on Bonanza who had the same sort of uh, ambiance in, in his persona. And so those two uh, really did uh, always inspire me. I, I think I don't think of myself as a Jimmy Stewart, but I certainly every once in a while recognize in my take on certain things in a scene. I go, oh, maybe I was influenced. And that's almost, you know, I guess if you're going to copy somebody, copy the best. You sure did. Now, you've said many times that one of your most important mentors in life was Leonard Katzman, the producer of Dallas. He was known as an old school, common sense guy who believed in working hard, putting your ego aside, doing your best for the sake of the show. What would you say was the most important career advice he ever gave you? Well, you know, it, it was a joke, but it was an I understood the meaning behind it. He said, you know, the best thing I can tell you is always hang up your wardrobe before you leave your dressing room. And what that meant to me was he had a respect for every single person on a set, from craft service to a, you know, a lighting technician to a wardrobe person to anybody. Everybody deserved the same level of respect. And I never saw him waver from that. And I saw him confronted with situations where I couldn't understand why he didn't just blow his stack. But always he had this measured you know, attitude about things, not to mention the fact that he was an old school. He was in the Columbia, you know, television genre where they did a new television show every four days. You know, it was it was gun and shoot kind of television in those days. But it, what it meant was you are mentally prepared. I never saw him have a shot list, but I never saw him waver from what he wanted. So all of these things um, just led. And he took me as a student. Uh, you know, I watched him, but uh, he he recognized in me that I was following him, basically. And he was like a second father to me. He was truly a mentor. He got me the Dallas job. He just offered it to me. I was doing the show Man from Atlantis opposite the stage where he was uh, producing uh, Logan's Run with Gregory Harrison. And Gregory's show, who has been a friend of mine since 1976, his show was canceled about two months before mine was. So I was still working. Leonard was preparing Dallas and he had known about me, but he went over and talked to my crew on Men from Atlantis. And he said, what kind of an actor is this kid? You know, what is it? And they gave me apparently a good report card. And the next thing I knew, he, he asked me, you know, would you be interested in playing this part on Dallas? And I took it. So, uh, and he also got me uh, step by step. So he was he was the person that really guided my career. Well, you couldn't have had a better mentor than him. Now, I know you've been asked a million questions about Dallas, so I'm not, I promise, I will not dwell on it too long. But I, I want love the show and I love my character. You can ask whatever you want. Well, that's sweet. I, I wanted to start by paying tribute to the wonderful Barbara Bell Geddes, who played the beloved Miss Ellie. When she passed away in 2005, I saw you give an interview and you said there's never been another mother like her on dramatic television. What made her so special in your opinion? She was the most powerful presence uh, on camera and in the, in, in the show uh, without asserting herself at all. She was, and, and I think that was this, baggage of her career that she carried with her all the time. And Julie Harris was the same when I did The Last of Mrs. Lincoln with Julie. But Barbara came to work, you know, completely prepared, but not full of it. You didn't know that she was prepared. Uh, she didn't exhibit anything. She would be rowdy and raucous with all of us. But when the moment came, she was so present and she's a tiny little thing. 
You know, he was a little bit bigger than Charlene, but not much. But, you know, and the script also supported that in her. You know, everybody wanted to please Mama or Miss Ellie. You know, Big Jim Davis. It was always Miss Ellie, you know. And, and so she was the matriarch of the family. But only you could have gotten other actresses to play that part that wouldn't have had the power, that innate internal power to command a set and to command a scene. But that's, you know, that's a woman who'd been on stage her whole life, done major motion pictures, worked with the greatest directors. It was a, it was a joy to work with her. As much as I loved Donna Reed when she came on the show to play Miss Ellie, it was a different energy. And that's why Barbara came back. Well, you know, I think people related to Barbara because she was the epitome of compassion despite her own pain. Does that make oh, yeah. sense? Oh, it, ma it makes absolute sense because there was nobody else that brought this dysfunctional family together through a compassion, through the sense of family is more important than everything else you're doing. And she was the puppet master to, to assuage you know, problems, situations, bring people back to the table, literally sometimes to the dinner table, the breakfast table. But uh, as a person, she was also that way. You know, she her her pastime was making tiny little greeting cards with tiny little ducks on them, and she would paint these little farm ducks and and, and squirrels and things on little greeting cards and send them to people. She was just this pixie of a of a woman, but um, with a heart bigger than her whole body. Yeah, she was amazing. Now, of course, I have to mention the brilliant Larry Hagman. I <laughs> once heard you describe him as a Pied Piper. What did you mean by that? Again, uh, you know, Larry had the opportunity on Dallas because he was the most important and the largest television star in the world for a number of years. And that can be worn as, uh, you know, a, a warm, snuggly coat or a suit of armor. And Larry was never uh, Larry Hagman, the star on the show, on Dallas, in his relationships. He was without doubt, my best friend for 40 plus years. He became my best friend when I shook his hand the first time I met him in my mind. I went home and I told my wife, I said, I think I met my best friend today. And he had the same feeling and I was by his bedside when he died. So, he, but he, he led by exuberance, being the lightest uh, heart on the set, always full of fun, but boy, was he there when the camera rolled. And he and I, we're absolutely insufferable on the set. I mean, we were horrible in the sense of we never took anything seriously. We were always trying to one up each other on a practical joke. But literally, when they would clap the board and say "and action," we could be Bobby and Jr. And then when they said "cut," you know, we would go back to his room or my room and laugh and giggle and have a glass of champagne and you know enjoy life for a total of sixteen years on the show. What an amazing experience. I read that before deciding to do Dallas, Mr. Duffy, you had the chance to be the father on Lassie. What made you choose Dallas? Well, that's the story. And it's, this comes full circle to, to the love of my life now, Linda Pearl. When Atlantis was canceled, it had a, a, a sort of a niche uh, excitement about it. It was one of the first, I think myself and, and, and Six Million Dollar Man, we were the first real superhero television shows. So even though I was canceled, there was a buzz about the show. And by virtue of that, you know, me as that character. So I was given a total of five scripts by my agent that had been submitted. Uh, would you, would your client be interested in A, B, C, D, E? So I, one of them was to play the father in Lassie. Another was to play Linda Pearl's husband on uh, young pioneers, they were recasting and, and they sent the script and said, would he like to play the husband on the young pioneers? And I can't remember the other three, but one of the other three was Dallas. And the only reason literally that I took Dallas was Dallas was a five episode miniseries. The others were a one-off. It was one pilot of Lassie. I had one chance on Linda Pearl's show, uh, you know, and then I had five chances on Dallas. And it was a mere matter of finance. I said, oh, well, I need the money, so I'm going to do Dallas. Now, when you agreed to play Bobby Ewing on Dallas, were you aware that the original plan was for your character to die after five episodes? 
I wasn't aware at the moment. Leonard told me this story. Leonard Kassman told me this story that the, the, the original script was that Bobby would die. And, you know, but when we got the scripts, that had already been passed over. But the story is Bobby was going to die and they were having all the pre-production meetings at, at CBS. And Leonard was the one in this meeting, you know, they said, okay, now after episode five, Bobby dies. And then Pamela and JR, I think, and Leonard said, excuse me, uh, why does Pamela stay at the ranch? Bobby dies, they're married. She gets like $250 million dollars. She would go to the Dallas and get a beautiful, you know, penthouse apartment and do it. They said, oh, no, no. She has to stay in the house. That's where the dump. He said, she won't stay in the house if Bobby's dead and she has all that money. And one of the executives, there was a pause, Leonard said. And one of the executives said, well, maybe Bobby doesn't die. And that was the beginning of my career because Leonard posed the question. Wow. Now you went from being the star of your own TV show to being part of an ensemble. Was that a big adjustment for you? Yes. In all honesty, it was. Not, not in terms of being happy or unhappy. It was impossible to be unhappy on the set and with the friends, who to this day, every one of them are still dear friends of mine. And as a matter of fact, this weekend, we're all getting together again. So it's, it, it was the happiest working situation in my life, but I had to adjust to you know, being part of an ensemble, and then when when Hag I call him Haggy when Hagman, you know, skyrocketed, it was fantastic for all of us, and I was no there was nobody happier than myself. But when my contract was up in seven years, I thought the show is as big as the show can get. Maybe now is the time to jump off, use that publicity, get my own show, and and start off again. And with the blessing of Leonard Katzman and the cast and everybody, except Larry, he didn't want me to go. I, I quit the show, which is, you know, common knowledge. And it was the, it was not a good business decision. It was not a good emotional decision. I learned, you know, halfway through the, the next season that I was not happy where I was working. I had jobs, they weren't the best, you know. It didn't, I didn't get my own television show instantly. And then I got a call from Haggy. And it was back in the day when you had a message machine. It was before, you know, your cell phone would beep you. And he, I listened to the message and, and he said, this is Hagman. I want you to come out to Malibu. Let's get drunk. I want to talk to you. And when I turned off the machine, I turned to my wife and I said, they're going to ask me to come back on the show. And that's what happened. I went out to Malibu and Haggy said, you got to come back. I'm not happy. And you're not doing what you thought you should do. And this was the best job you'll ever have in your life. So let's go to work. And that's what did. That's what happened. Yeah. And we all remember that famous shower scene. That's for sure. When you were asked in an interview why you left the show after seven years, you said it was hubris that made you do it. And I thought that was so odd because you're not a person that demonstrates that. You, you have no ego. You're very well known to be extremely humble, very kind. You're a consummate professional. Your own role models were people that had no egos. So I wonder if it really was hubris, looking back. Well, I'm not sure I haven't got my Webster's next to me, but my personal definition of hubris is essentially a, an irrational decision based on a, a, a lack of complete knowledge of the situation. So, you know, I had a sense of my own ability to be the star of my own television show because I had exemplified that. I, I thought I knew the business well enough that, you know, the success of Atlantis, the success of Dallas would, you know, guarantee with a small G the success of finding another show for me. And that's what I think uh, is my definition of hubris. It was, you know, I was... 20, no, by then I was I was 34, I think, 35, something like that. That's that's not, you know, for me, that wasn't old enough to really be that savvy about the industry, the tenor of the times, uh, you know, how fortunate I was to be in the position I was in on Dallas, you know, all of those things. So it, it was hubris, not arrogance. I, I, I don't think it was arrogance. I, I, you know, I have my own level of ego. I think we all do and should have. But I, I just think it was a, a bit rash, a bit immature, but based on a sense of capability. And that's what I thought, you know, when I said hubris. 
Well, when you look at the immense popularity and success of Dallas all over the world, mm -hmm. I happen to think that part of the reason for that success was the on-screen chemistry between all of you in that ensemble, which really was impacted by the fact that you were such good friends off camera, don't you think? Absolutely, I do. Linda refers to it as the fairy dust. That, you know, the casting was sprinkled with fairy dust when we got together. Uh, the original six of us were as a family that a family could be until the day that, you know, individuals left, unfortunately, and the show was canceled. But it was, we loved each other. I mean, literally loved each other as as people. So there was that chemistry. And and also there was there was a, a trust on the set. Um, there, there was no prima donna. Everybody gave to the other actor whatever that other actor needed on set. So, you know, we had guest stars all the time, lovely, wonderful, big star guest stars. And almost to a person, they would come to the producers and say, isn't there a way I could be a regular on this show? I would really like to. And they wanted to come and work on this set with these people. So, uh, yeah, it was chemistry, fairy dust. Well, starting in season four, I think, you began directing episodes of the show. You directed 30 episodes of Dallas. Okay. I wondered if your relationship with your fellow cast members changed, if if at all, once you started directing them. I can all, I can't speak for their inner thoughts or or their 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 sort of need initial reaction. Larry, again, the Pied Piper led the way. He directed first. He directed it, I think, in the second year. And I had I had always wanted to direct, not because I thought I wanted to direct, but it looked to me so much fun. And I was always, as an actor, half of my brain, no matter what the scene was, I was I was looking and thinking, oh God, that's a good shot over there. And I wonder if we're gonna go over and get the camera over there and do that. And I never asserted myself, uh, but it was all part of my mental process. So once Haggy started directing, I went to Leonard, my friend, and I asked him if if he thought I could and should. And he said, yes. And he gave me an episode, a single episode. And he essentially said to me, he said, I, I give you this episode to do. You have to earn any other episode you get. And, and I knew what that meant. I, you know, I was either going to sink or swim by what I produced on that first episode. And I enjoyed it. And, you know, I came in under budget, under time. Uh, and the other actors, because we had this sense of trust with one another, I never, I never gave an actor a direction that I didn't think that they wouldn't interpret it as that I wanted them to look better on camera, that I wanted them to shine. Whether I was in the scene with them or not, it didn't matter that it was always, oh, this is going to be, you look, this will be fantastic. You, you know, It was that kind of, uh, I only wanted to direct to make the show and all my friends look great and be great. And I think they didn't think I was being... Um, you know, a, a dictator or or a power hungry or any of that stuff, and um, and that's why I ended up directing thirty of them. But a, a reporter once in a meeting asked Leonard Kassman, He said, "The reporter asked, when do you know an actor is ready to direct?" And without missing a beat, Leonard said, "When their lawyer tells me they are." Oh, that's <laughs> hilarious. Well, when we had Linda Gray on the show, she confirmed that they loved having you as a director. I know you also directed 49 episodes of Step by Step, which was another great show. You co-starred in that show for seven seasons with the wonderful Suzanne Summers, whom we lost last year. I understand you became very close friends with her from day one, right? Yeah, I always say she became my Larry Hagman. When, when Dallas was canceled, you know, Haggy and I, we said, well, we'll never work together again because if we step on camera, everybody's going to say, oh, look, it's JR and Bobby. So we, we just said, oh, that's, you know, we'll never work together, but we were still friends. I would, we would get together all the time. But the first day I went in to meet with Suzanne Summers at the Miller Boyette offices, uh, I looked at her and she looked at me and we just clicked. And I literally said, well, you're my new Larry Hagman. And we referred to each other. She always referred to me to the day she died. I was her second husband after Alan. And, and in front of Alan, it wasn't, it wasn't a problem for Alan. I was the second husband. She was my second wife. And it, that was our relationship with each other, literally, again, till she died. 
Well, the role of Frank Lambert on Step by Step was your first regular role in a sitcom. Did mm-hmm. Suzanne teach you a lot about comedic acting? Yes, in the in and then let me preface by saying um, when Leonard pitched me to Miller Boyette for uh, the role of Frank Lambert on a on a sitcom, Miller Boyette looked at him like he was crazy. Uh, Tom Miller and Bob Boyette, and they said, "But he's Patrick Duffy. He's not a he's not funny." And so Leonard sent them the uh, outtake reels from Dallas, and and the, the the really the person behind me getting that job was a. a the writer producer Bill Bickley, and Bill Bickley said he looked at that and went, "Oh my God, he's funny. We can do anything. He's fearless, fearless in the sense of not being afraid to embarrass myself." So I went in thinking I could do it, but I, for the first, you know, I would say half a season, I would look at Suzanne after every take, and and she, we would look at each other, and she'd give me a a nod or a. Mm. And if I got a, hmm, then I'd say, could we do that one more time? Let me try something else, you know. But after the first, you know, six or so episodes, we we both understood that we liked the way each other worked. And I think it was the second season of that show I started directing. And she loved it when I directed. So, uh, you know, we were a team. And we were the parents for that group. Uh, again, those children are like my children. I wrote letters of a recommendation for Stacy Keenan to get into law school. And she's now a district attorney in Los Angeles. And here's another story is in on March 17th, my birthday, the step-by-step group is getting together. And, you know, I'm going out to dinner with Christine and, and Sasha and, and, you know, it would be Suzanne if she were here, uh, Brandon call. Uh, and we're hoping Stacy will come, but it's whether she can get out of, you know, whatever courtroom she's assigned to, but they became my family. So I've been so fortunate, as I said, when we first started that I have literally knock on wood, never had a bad day at work. Never. Well, they've been very fortunate to have you. And I have to say, Mr. Duffy, you've had some very special moments in your career. I want to ask you about a few of them. Mm -hmm. I really, really loved your guest appearance on Dolly Parton's TV show in 1987, do you remember doing that? Was it fun? Oh, my God. Do I remember it? Dolly Parton was our mascot when we were doing Dallas. We, Larry and I and Steve rented a house together one year, and we had a giant poster of her on the front door. And we would kiss the poster before we went to work, you know, and we would come home and it was, Dolly, we're home. And we loved it. And so when I was asked to be, she had a segment on her show. And it was the surprise date or Dolly's date or something. And, uh, you know, a knock would come at the door and she would open the door and it would be, you know, me, Bert Convy, whoever, you know, was at the person of the of the moment. And I got to do it with her. And I, she was amazing and wonderful. And again, fearless. Whatever the joke wanted to be, she was game for it. Absolutely. Let's do that. You know, and I got to kiss Dolly Parton. I mean, I was ready to quit my career and retire. It was the best ever. Yeah, that was a great, great show. And another really special moment for me was in 1983, you recorded two duets called Together We're Strong and Something's Going On with the most popular singer in France, probably of all of Europe, Mireille Mathieu. How did that come about? Oh, my God. The the worst decision her producers ever made. Not at all. I love that song, Together We're Strong. Okay, well, good. It came, obviously it came because Dallas was so popular and they thought, you know, why not bring them together? And, you know, she was an icon. She was the Edith Piaf of her day and is to this day. And and Bobby was a, a very popular character in Europe, especially in France and Germany and, and everything. So they decided, well, let's have them do a song together. And they I said, do you sing? And I said, absolutely not. I've never sung. I probably never will. So they said, well, we'll write a special song for you. And they did with not many notes. If you'll notice that there's very few notes in that song for me to sing. She's all over the place because she's got the equipment of a bird. So they wrote the song. Uh, we rehearsed it and rehearsed it and finally recorded it together. And it was it was wonderful. I, and they brought me over to, to Europe uh, in France. We did a TV special where we sang together. And it became very popular. It sold a lot of copies, you know, whatever that is. But um, I never sang again after that uh, and have no plans to actually even though my my partner in life now Linda Pearl is a brilliant singer 
you know, is doing, uh, you know, her jazz shows all over the country. As a matter of fact, she'll be in Carmel, Indiana uh, in March doing her show at Feinstein's. And, and, you know, I go see everyone that I'm available to go see because that's what singing is about. Singing is the confidence in your instrument, being able to interpret a song as a play so the audience is drawn into it. Mireille had that. Uh, Linda has that in spades. And, you, you know, hubris did not carry me over into making any more singing. Let me just put it that way. Well, I read that you ruptured your vocal cords during your senior year of college, but clearly you recovered by 1983 because I thought you sang really well and millions of people bought that album. Yes, they did. And I did, you know, that was the rupturing of my vocal cords literally changed the trajectory of my career. I was, you know, destined, if you want to look at it that way, but very successful just before that accident happened in auditioning in a, in a system in the United States here of, of repertory theaters send all their representatives to one place, actors go and audition all in one town, and then they get offered contracts to go to different theaters around the country. I did that and was offered several contracts at very nice theaters, went back to school and then ruptured my vocal cords and had to turn down all of those plays, all of those theatrical things. And I spent over a year in you know, serious rehab and recovery. And, and then I had to start from scratch with a, a very soft voice, a very, you know, I would do things where I could record. I didn't go on stage again for a long time. I didn't do film because I, nobody asked me to, but I had jobs narrating things in a microphone where I could just literally talk very softly. And it, you know, that transferred into doing film and television where I wasn't doing eight shows a week to a, a you know 1200 seat house and stressing that thing that was still on the mend and it just shifted everything and i think it also affected my voice my vocal quality was uh, a, a different voice than i had in school uh, and uh, you know i look back and i think you know at the moment i thought well here's the end of my career and it was a life lesson it it, it made my career if you want to look at it that way and i think most of the obstacles in our life if we approach them correctly can turn out to be the most beneficial things, you know? Well, for so. sure. That was absolutely destiny at play again. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I have to mention, Mr. Duffy, that you are the envy of pretty much every man on earth because you did a two-episode guest appearance on season four of Charlie's Angels, where you yeah. romanced both Jacqueline Smith and Cheryl Ladd. Now yes. that, and you got paid to do that. Okay. You know, I would have, I would have paid them to do it. And and actually, that's the reason they had to kill my character, because they they realized that the chemistry was so good with Jacqueline and with Cheryl, and they as characters on the show fell in love with my character, and wa wanted to marry him, wanted to be you know either one of them wanted to be, and they, the the producers Aaron they, they couldn't resolve that problem, and the only way they could resolve it was to kill the character. And so I unfortunately had to die, but I consummated the relationship with both before I died. Yes, you and died happy for sure. There was a, a very funny thing happened in the scene with Jacqueline. We were on a boat. It was on a, a like a, not a yacht, but a, a, a luxury boat. And we were having our romantic moment. And the scene was, you know, as we start to kiss and canoodle, um, then the camera's outside and you see us slip down behind the window and, you know, as the, everything. And we had a lovely housekeeper in in our in our home, and she came running out of her uh, of her quarters and into where we were having dinner the night that it was on the air, and she just came in and she went, oh, oh, Mr. Duffy, oh, oh, Mr. Duffy, and then ran back in the room. She had watched the episode and she thought it was it was pretty good. <laughs> so yeah, it, it was, was pretty good. It, <laughs> it really was. I so yeah. enjoyed. It. You appeared as Stephen Logan in 155 episodes of The Bold and the Beautiful. Now, we've had a number of soap opera stars on our show. We've had Eric Braden, Louise Sorrell, Kevin Spiritus. Wow. And they've all said that the actors who appear in soap operas are the hardest working actors in the industry, even though they often feel like they get the least respect. Do you agree with that? Yes, it, it, it requires a bit of a, a, a nuance, though. I think every actor is a hardworking actor. Uh, what makes soap operas so 
labor intensive, I think is if you want to think of hard working, labor intensive. I think every good actor puts everything they have into whatever they're doing, whether it's a primetime soap, a, a primetime show or a soap opera or, you know, a stage production or whatever. But what a soap opera actor has to do on a daily basis, five days a week, is the equivalent of a month's worth of television shows. I, when I started Bold and the Beautiful, um, the first day of work, I had 30 pages of dialogue. Just me. And the scenes I was in were 30 pages that I had to get done within a working day that was shorter than a TV primetime working day. And on a Dallas, on an average day, I would have six or seven pages of dialogue. And that would be it. And we had 12 hours to do that in. On, on soap operas, yes, they are the hardest working. There's nobody that labors harder that has more responsibility on a moment to moment basis. And the other thing they have is no rehearsal. They, the no luxury of, I'd like to experiment with this, or maybe this feels right. It, I mean, a rehearsal on a soap is a director jumping down from the booth and going, okay, on this line, you have to be over by the fireplace. And then you have to come over here on that line and pick up the drink and do the boop, boop, boop. And then it's up to you as an actor to justify those moments so you don't look like you know you're uh, some puppet master is is doing their job. So uh, yes, hardest working, and I think there was a, a stigma for a long time attached to soap opera actors as well. They're not prime time. No, no, they're not prime time. But I don't think that's true anymore. And I think it's it's because so many prime time actors are doing soap operas now. You see them. So many big movie stars are doing TV shows now. There's an uh, egalitarian approach to our profession now that I think is very healthy. Well, the soap opera sounds like a great training ground, if you ask me. It's a muscle. Your memory is a muscle. And it, it takes exercise. And my friend Gregory Harrison is the same thing. He's on um, uh, General Hospital. And, you know, he's like a, a, a mirror image of, of my career, which is he's had television shows all the time and movies and everything. When he started General Hospital, his story is the same. He had 30, 40 pages of dialogue. He's going, oh, my God. And it, it takes a while, but your brain goes, OK, here's my job now. And you get to where you can memorize that. Well, in recent years, you've starred on stage in the UK in a touring production of 12 Angry Men. You played the Henry Fonda role, juror number eight. And you also toured the UK in Catch Me If You Can with our beautiful Linda. Do you yeah. enjoy doing theater as much as performing in front of the camera? Equally, I would say equally so. The, the, the challenges are different. Again, uh, there's a lot more technical minute by minute things that you have to cope with on film. Uh, but there is the terrifying aspect on stage that just before you walk on, you realize for the next 90 minutes to two and a half hours, there's no safety net. There's no take two. There's no, oops, I'm sorry, I forgot that. What is that line again? That is something that few people uh, other than actors experience. You know, maybe sports people do because you don't get take two on, on most sporting events or high diving. You don't get to do it again. You know, if you miss the pool, that pretty much is it. But theater to me, if you're in a good play and 12 Angry Men was phenomenal. We, we were 12 of the closest, again, uh, men. It was all men in this performance, obviously 12 Angry Men. But we rehearsed for three weeks uh, and that was the bonding. After three weeks, there was complete trust and respect. And then we hit the boards in Windsor and I did uh, I did t uh, 12 Angry Men, two and a half months, almost three months of that. And that, that company went on after I left the show. I couldn't do the rest of the tour. They're still on tour now. Just this week, I communicate with them. They're still my friends. They had their hundredth episode uh, show just the other night. And they have probably another hundred to go before they wrap out. Did you enjoy life on tour? I did both both shows. On the first tour, Catch Me If You Can was seven months, but I was with Linda. And it was, it was you know, on the road romance. You know, we played, uh, you know, uh, combative characters in the show. But the fact that we were in a car together in the UK, every week we would go drive unbeknownst where we were going or what the theater was going to look like. Thank God for GPS. 
we jump in the car with our suitcases and all the kitchen equipment and stuff. And sh she had pre-ordered a, a B and B, you know. So we drive to a, a new address, set up housekeeping for a week, all in one day. Report to the theater, do a, a, a line rehearsal, and open that night. And we did that for you know, seven months, and it was glorious to be together. Do you find a difference between English audiences and American audiences? Yes, yeah, we definitely do. Um, In terms of attentiveness? Everything, almost every box is ticked to a greater degree. First of all, they're not waiting at the end of the performance to how, how soon can we get our car out of the parking lot? That, that's the first thing. Also, they're raised in a culture of theater. Everybody there, the theater is a normal uh, cultural event for the for the Brits, where in our country, it's a special event. People go to the theater uh, rarely on a regular basis. Uh, you know, it's, oh, there's a great show coming to the Mark Taper in Los Angeles. Let's go see it. That's one thing. In the UK, it's, we'll go to the Windsor, to the Royal, to the Bath, or any of these different theaters, you know, no matter what's there, it's a theater. We're going to go and it's going to, we're going to enjoy it. And it's going to be the second thing. And, and I hope this doesn't offend people because it's not meant to be. They're somewhat smarter as an audience. And I think it's because they're trained to listen in a theater situation. When they go to the theater, they're not surprised that it's not television. You know, uh, American audiences are raised on film and television and the theater is an oddity. In England, it's it's a normal thing, and their their ear is attuned. They're they're with you from the moment the curtain comes up, and the first words leave an actor's mouth. And in that sense, that's what I mean: is they're smarter. They're there to to experience the entire thing intellectually as well as emotionally, and that's a big difference. You feel that on stage; you actually feel it. Yeah, there's a sophistication in a in a British audience. Would you ever consider doing a show on Broadway? Yeah, of course. You know, I, I would consider, you know, I'm one of these actors. And when the phone rings, before I say hello, I say yes, you know, because, you know, I love to work. I love every, every job I've had, I found has been enjoyable. So Broadway. Now, again, when a TV actor does Broadway, there's an expectation, I think, of, you know, who who does this person think they are and why should they be there? And so you're already beholden to measure up to some standard, you know, and, I, you know, I think that can affect different actors in different ways. I, I'm, I'm the interesting thing for me is I'm past that high arc of the, pro, the, the popularity of Dallas. So it's I wouldn't be doing a play on Broadway because Dallas is the number one show on TV and I just segue right into a, a Broadway show. So in that sense, it, you know, I, I would have less responsibility in, in coming into it, less pressure. And it would have to obviously be the right kind of part. And, uh, you know, but there's nothing more enjoyable than going to work every day. Well, I had an idea. It seems to me that 12 Angry Men, wouldn't it be great to have Linda be one of the jurors? I mean, if you could ever get the estate of uh, Reginald Rose to agree, why not have a female juror? Well, we actually, before we did Catch Me If You Can, the producer of that, the very famous and incredible uh, producer of, of theater in England, uh, Bill Kenwright, he approached Linda and I because we were all friends and he wanted to do 12 Angry Men with two women jurors, Linda and one other juror, and the estate would not allow it. So that's when we switched to Catch Me If You Can. And then he came back later and I did 12 Angry Men with all male cast. We thought the, the men in the cast of 12 Angry Men, we got together. We were asked that because we do a talk back after a couple of shows, you know, where the audience stays and you're on stage and you you have a conversation with them. And the question always came up, why not have a woman on the set, on the thing? And because we'd been doing the show and had been rehearsing, the, the reality of that is, yes, you could, but it would be heard through the ears of the 21st century uh, social political situation. It wouldn't be heard through the legal 
format of a jury's responsibility in the 1950s, which is when the play was written. And there is dialogue in 12 Angry Men that is just plain offensive if you say it to a woman. It wouldn't, it, it, you know, first of all, two thirds of the men on that show, their personalities as characters would never say that, would never voice that kind of outright rancor to a strange woman that they don't know. It would be couched in some sort of proper behavior for a, a 1954 male, you know, in, in America. And we thought it, it might not work without massive changes to the script, massive changes. And by virtue of that, we thought, well, a brilliant playwright could probably do it, or maybe you just need to visit a, a, a court a courtroom, you know, a jury room drama with men and women in an entirely different format. Because also you have to change the name. 12, uh, 10 angry men and two really upset women, or I'm not quite sure how you would have the poster. So I guess it would be 12 angry jurors. I, I asked so. because I'm not sure if you know, but I was a criminal and family court judge for 26 years before I started this show. And so I've I always envisage a criminal court jury play that right. did have a mixed jury because that's more realistic. But you're right, it would be a totally different play. Right. And there was a, a Saturday evening post cover in the 50s, and it was in a jury room. And I, I sent it to some of the guys in the show because I saw it here. And it shows 11 men in various stages hovering around a jury table and one woman at the head of the table sort of being bombarded by these 11 men. And that was in the 50s on Saturday Evening Post. So, you know, what that said was, you know, the entire problem of, of what this idea of putting a, a woman on the jury to, in today's market is, is that it was it was upsetting to watch for me to see that cover of these men sort of intimidating somebody as opposed to engaging in conversation. And that's the interesting thing in 12 Angry Men. It, there's very little intimidation. There's one character who blows up and gets crazy, but everybody recognizes it as he, he's it's, it's an abomination of the human spirit. So it's not intimidating. It's all logic and and debate and compassion and humanism and all these things. So it's it's a different, you know, it's a different beast when you throw a woman in the mix. It could be a very interesting beast. I'm not saying that it shouldn't be done. I'm saying that this particular play by Reginald Rose, the way it is written, I don't think supports that without, like you said, major, uh, uh, you know, attacks on the actual text itself. Now, on top of everything else you're doing, you and Linda have a company that sells sourdough bread starter called Duffy's Dough. How did that come about? Oh, my God. The, the shortest way I can tell that story is my parents took our family uh, in 1952. Uh, I, I had my third birthday on the road. They put us, uh, my dad and mom got an old truck, uh, uh, I think about a 14 or 13 foot little trailer behind it, loaded up as much food as they could and drove from Montana to Alaska in 1952 on the old Alcan Highway, which was not paved. It was a gravel road made by the Army Corps of Engineers. And we spent a year and a half in Alaska. And while we were there, my mother was gifted a sourdough starter by an old woman who at the time said it came with the Alaska gold rush miners. So it was, you know, 80, 90 years old at that moment. My, my mother got it in 1952. It's been in our family for those 70 years. My sister got it, and then I inherited a starter from that same original starter and have been baking with it for, you know, 25, 30 years. When Linda and I became a couple, uh, desperately trying to impress her, I started baking uh, using my sourdough. And there was one, whether it was the cinnamon rolls or the pancakes or the dinner rolls or whatever it was, you know, it was very good night. And I said, you know, this would make a great business if we could just, you know, get something started. She took it and ran with it. I didn't do another thing for it. She thought it was a great idea. She developed the business model. She she designed the, the cartons, the boxes that it would come in. She found out we had to take cooking classes and, and food handling uh, uh, verifications and 
and pass a test in Colorado. We had to get a, a sanctioned kitchen. She did all of that. And we put out 200 units of this sourdough as a, and we got some guidance from some very smarty pants uh, business people. And we made 200 units because they said, do 200, try and sell them by Christmas. If they don't sell by Christmas, uh, at least you've got Christmas presents for all your friends. So we made them, we, we opened uh, the business in, in September. And the day that we put them on the market, it's all by mail, you know, by email um, website. Um, we had a lovely write-up in People Magazine and within 24 hours, we sold all 200 units. And we went, that's great. And then we said, oh no, what do we do now? We got to make more. And that's when we went into high gear, you know, truckloads of flour and sugar and rolling pins and aprons and cookbooks and boxes and everything. And um, we're still doing this business. It's, you know, duffysdough.com. Um, the, the interesting reason we're doing it is that 100% of our net profits go to charity. Linda and I don't make a penny off of this. Uh, we pay for the, the, the contents of the kit and then 100% of the profits, the net profits, uh, go to charities. Uh, and they're all food-based charities. Uh, no Kid Hungry, you know, soup kitchens, local, any, anything like that. That's what we're donating it to. So everyone, you can learn more about Duffy's Dough by going to their official website, duffysdough.com. So tell me, Mr. Duffy, at this stage of your life, would you ever consider taking on a regular role in a long-running TV series again? Absolutely, I would. I don't think I've used up all my energies or my... And interpretation is not the right word, but I think I have more to give. I enjoy it. I, I, I can you know, make the day's work, you know, I can be there on time, I can say my lines. And if the script writes a good character that, that fits me, there's no reason I wouldn't do another series. It's the best working situation in the world. I, I don't have children that live at home now. I have grandchildren that live with their, their parents. I have Linda as a partner, you know, she does her singing career and we act together a lot. You know, we played a couple on Bold and Beautiful. We played husband and wife on two movies already and on stage uh, we're doing a third movie right now that she just wrapped and i have two more days where we're husband and wife again so working is my is, is the balm of my life it's it's how i enjoy myself so the more the, the better well i hope that a project is developed for the two of you for a for a series that would be wonderful because we found we work together very well. You know, it could be a disaster. You know, you might you might want to have some off time, but we find we don't. You know, her singing career, I, I go to as many of her concerts as I can. She's brilliant. We will not sing together. I can guarantee you that. But um, uh, it's good that she's the brilliant actress she is because we have that avenue to pursue our togetherness. Well, I have a feeling it's going to happen. Do you do you have any interest in sitting down and writing a memoir? No, uh, I absolutely do not. Everything that is public knowledge about my life, and there's a lot, when you've been in the business as long as I have, you know, they pretty much everybody knows just about everything there is to know about me. I don't have secrets, but I have a, a private life. Uh, I've never done an interview in my home. Uh, and when the boys were growing up, uh, I they were never included in any press because I just felt I needed some place that I would call my own. And my mind is that place now. And, uh, you know, I could write I could write stories about being on the Dallas set, but I've told all those stories. I've told them in interviews. Uh, uh, there have been no secrets, no skeletons in the closet on any of the shows that I've been on. I'm, uh, there's no kiss and tell. You know, it's it's just been a fun existence professionally. Uh, even my private life that is known is is an open book. Uh, you know, I, I make the joke because I've been asked this question before. I say, well, what am I going to divulge that I mowed my own lawn? Uh, you know, or that I loved going grocery shopping? It's, you know, it's not really an interesting. My public life is much more interesting than my private life. Well, luckily for us, we've been able to experience that public life time and time again through great shows, great movies, on the stage. It's been such a pleasure meeting you, Mr. Duffy, and having this chance to interview you. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. 
Well, thank you. And, and now I can say, because I didn't want to throw you a curve, it's so strange to hear you call me Mr. Duffy. I wanted you to call me Patrick, but I didn't want to interrupt you. So I'm calling you Harvey and not Mr. Brownstone. So please call me Patrick. I absolutely will from here on in. Thank you again. I really appreciate you coming on our show. My pleasure, Harvey. Thank you. Our guest has been the iconic actor and director, Patrick Duffy. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my production assistants, Rosa Puzo and Robert Monaghan, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.